Father, we thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to share your word tonight, to get into it, to um, to really to get your word into us. We also thank you for what you're doing through this little church and the uh, impact that we're having uh, in Kenya. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would continue, Lord, to prepare uh, the hearts, prepare uh, the pastors and all of that, and, and that you would do a marvelous work while we go there. Uh, and Father, uh, tonight, though, we want you to speak to us. Prepare our hearts now. Give us ears that are open. We want to hear from you this evening, Lord. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we're in Romans 15 now. And uh, like we uh, saw last week, that we shouldn't condemn one another when it comes to taking a, a stand on peripheral uh, issues. I, I should say last week we saw that. Uh, not like we saw last week, but last week we saw how we shouldn't condemn people that take a, a particular stand on uh, peripheral issues like eating meat or eating meat that was sacrificed to idols maybe, uh, or what day to worship on, or even whether a Christian can have a glass of wine with dinner or not. Uh, that we, we shouldn't condemn one another in that. We saw that. And we saw when it comes down to being um, uh, exercise and liberty or not, we really do have to be fully convinced in our own minds. And to do that, we have to do that through prayerful study of God's Word uh, as to what <laughs> we're going to believe in those doubtful or debatable issues. And we also learn that whatever a believer does, conscience is a huge deal. Remember towards the end of the chapter, uh, we saw that if we really aren't convinced that something is okay and we do it anyway against our conscience, then to us, Paul said that it's sin. And probably the hardest thing that we saw last week, the hardest thing for us, freedom-loving Americans with all of our rights, <laughs> the hardest thing is the concept that if I do what causes someone else to stumble in their walk with Christ, then I should not do it. Oh, that's, that's tough, man. That is hard. Setting aside, aside our rights not doing what we would prefer to do because of someone else. That, that's hard. That's hard for our flesh <laughs> to, to give that up. It, it's really back, though, to the most important thing. And that is, for every believer, the most important thing is that we should be walking in love towards each other. Not just this phony kind of uh, syrupy kind of, love you, man and then do the most unloving things to each other or behind each other's backs, but really love, as 1 Corinthians 13 describes it. And, and now Paul continues on in that same line of reasoning, really stressing the need for us to really lay aside our own desires and look out for the well-being of others. In other words, others before self. That's the way that we're to live. That, that, that's supposed to be our life. And, and that is a difficult thing for our flesh, isn't it? So let's start with verses 1 and 2. We then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. Remember, we read last week in chapter 14, verse 2, for one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. It's the he who is weak eats only vegetables. The weak person does that. They don't eat the meat. Uh, we talked about that. But it's the one who is stronger in the faith, he said, that believes he can eat all things. So here, Paul points out that it's the responsibility of the strong, of those who consider themselves strong in the faith, to condescend to the scruples of the weak. And the scruples, that word, I'm going to read what uh, the Oxford Dictionary of Christian Church uh, defines that word scruples as, quote, unfounded fears that there is sin where there is none, end of quotes. So even though you know it's okay, you don't eat. Instead, he's saying, we're to bear with the weak. Folks, that's real love. When we set aside our rights, our desires, what pleases us in order to, to not, not 
just please in a, in a kind of a carnal sense, but really to take care of, to look out for, to bear with the weaker brother and sister. That's what love is. That's real love. 1 Corinthians 13, where Paul tells us that the most important thing is love. He goes on to describe what love is. And in verse 7, it says love, under that definition, he says, bears all things. And that word bear means to endure, to put up with an annoyance or difficulty, according to one dictionary. Uh, and, and I was looking at uh, Greek dictionaries here for the, uh, the underlying word of that. And it also means to cover with silence, to endure patiently. So this is what this means. It means to put up with the inconvenience of someone else's weaker faith and shut up about it. <laughs> you know, don't nag them, don't rag them, don't, don't harass them about it. Remember, we saw last week, the very first thing that, that we saw was that he said that we should receive someone weak in the faith, but not just so that we can argue with them. Just receive them and hey, cover it with silence. <laughs> just love them. And, and real Christianity, again, isn't about pleasing ourselves. It's about doing What's best for those around us? How can we edify or build up? That's what that word edify means. It means to build up. And we need to, to see how we can build up the other person, not ourselves. So often I hear people about, you know, about I want, me, my, I want, it's about me, and all that kind of stuff. And I remember what my pastor down in Tucson said, what Robert Furrow said one time, and actually he said it several times. But I remember one particular Wednesday night, he, he said, you know, I could stand here from the pulpit and for 45 minutes, I could say, it's not about you. It's not about you. It's not about you. <laughs> and he said, I still couldn't say it enough because we have it in our minds so much, especially as Americans with our rights. It is about me. It's all about me. And we get that kind of into our heads and we really need to stay away from that. We need to check ourselves on that. We need to understand it's not about us. It's about the Lord. And the Lord loves the weaker brother and sister. You know, he loves them. And so if he loves them, then we should love them and we should put up with them patiently and not be on their case about it. And we, Paul gives us the best example ever. Look at verse 3. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Now he's referring to Psalm 69, 9. And let's read that. Because zeal for your house has eaten me up, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. So we know who this was a reference to. It was a reference to Jesus, right? And when else was this Psalm 69, 9 quoted in the New Testament? It was quoted right after Jesus turned over the money changers' uh, tables in the temple for the first time. In John 2, 17, it says, Then his disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house has eaten me up. Now at first it seems like it's like two entirely different things being spoken of there in Psalm 69, 9. But it's not. It's, it's the thing is that both of those things are about Jesus. Both have to do with him overturning the tables. It's two different aspects of the same event. Okay? <laughs> the first part, because zeal for your house has eaten me up, that answers the immediate why. Why is he doing that? Why is, it, why, is, why is he so upset? He made a whip of small cords, he, and, and he's driving these guys out. Why is he doing that? Because he's zealous for God's house. And the second part, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. The word reproach means to disgrace, to dishonor, to insult. See, the disgrace and the dishonor being done to Yahweh, the Father, and his temple, by these corrupt money changers and the corrupt priests that were there that were getting a cut of what was going on there, of all the business, <sighs> that reproach, that dishonor, as they turned God's house into a place to rip people off and, and a place that looked like a flea market. 
That reproach fell heavy on Jesus' heart. He was burdened with that. And Paul uses this as an example for us, that Jesus didn't live to please himself. It was all about the will of the Father. In John 4, 34, Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And in John 5, 30, Jesus said, I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. And in John 6, 38, Jesus said, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus was all about not doing his will, but the will of the Father, the one who sent him. It would have been much easier for Jesus just to ignore what was going on in the temple. It would have been a lot safer for him. In fact, when you look at what happens after both the first and the second cleansing, and you know that he cleansed the temple twice, right? Once at the beginning of his ministry, and another time at the end of his ministry. If you look at what happened immediately after those, uh, it was those two events that really caused the Jewish leaders to want to kill him. They really stepped up their game as far as wanting to kill him, especially the second time he did it. See, Jesus disregarded himself. He disregarded his safety and his needs, and instead he put the Father first. And he was putting the needs of the people before his own as well. Because, see, the people needed to understand that the Father loved them, that the Father disapproved of what was going on there, and, and that, that, that God didn't want them to be chased away. Because remember, we had read when we were studying uh, those places in the Gospels that the people hated coming to the temple. They, they despised it because they were being taken advantage of. They were forcefully being taken advantage of. And God needed to know, or they needed to know, rather, of God's love, of God's care for them. And so Jesus did what was inconvenient and really unsafe for him in order to do the will of the Father and to do what the people needed him to do. And the cross is the extreme of that, you know. But that's our example that Paul uses here in this area of not pleasing ourselves. We shouldn't live to please ourselves, but instead we should look out for our brothers and sisters, how we can build them up and not tear them down. Philippians 2, 4, I think we quoted it last week. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. In verse 4 here in Romans, it says, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. See, all the things that God made sure that were recorded uh, in the Old Testament are for us today to learn by. A lot of times I'll talk to people and they'll say, Oh, you're a pastor. And, well, where are you teaching? You know, uh, uh, are you going through the Bible? Yeah. Well, where are you teaching? Well, on Sundays we're going through the Old Testament. Oh, the Old Testament. Oh, my goodness. You know, why would you do that? Well, because of this right here. It's for our learning. And that's one of the reasons why I always try and show the connection between the New Testament and the Old Testament, that there's really not a disconnect. It's one flow from, from Genesis to Revelation. It's all the gospel. It's all for our benefit. It, God wants us to understand these things. And we receive both patience and comfort from the Word of God. You know, we see the models for, for patience, for patiently, obediently waiting on God, like we learned this last Sunday, right? We see those things in the Word of God. We see how the Old Testament saints waited and, and how they were rewarded. And we receive comfort from the Word of God when we see how that, that God was involved, so involved in the lives of the Old Testament saints and sometimes when they weren't even aware of it. We, we see those things and we can be comforted by that. Uh, that kind of stuff gives us hope. See, that hope isn't like, well, I hope so. 
it's really an absolute certainty about future events. We can be absolutely certain of the future that God has promised to us because we see how faithful God was to those who trusted in Him before. Those, those things that were written in the Old Testament being fulfilled um, in their lives sometimes and sometimes in the life of Jesus or in the, uh, the lives of the New Testament saints, that kind of thing, in the lives of the church. But we see those things happening. We can say, hey, okay, I've got hope. And I could trust in God because he always comes through. Then verses 5 and 6, he says, Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another, according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The more that we seek to put others first and to put our needs last, the more we will be like-minded. Think about that. The more that we put other people's needs first and set our needs in the background, the less divisions there will be. See, if you're concerned about what's best for the person sitting next to you or in front of you or behind you, if you're concerned about the people that you fellowship with, it's not going to be all about you. You're not going to be scratching and clawing to get your will done. You're not going to be saying, well, if you don't do this and I'm leaving the church, you won't be doing that. You'll be looking out and you're going to want to care for, for those around you. Putting their needs or, or maybe their perceived needs at least (laughs) and desires uh you know above yours and and folks that's the way we're to live but when we decide that we're going to look out for number one (laughs) being ourselves that's where that's where the problem is when someone is being self-willed and putting their needs or what they think (laughs) they need and their desires above others above the rest of the body's needs above the weaknesses of the others (laughs) then that's where the divisions happen. Let me explain something here. <laughs> right now, within this church here, there are several, a number of people who wish that we would include other songs. They're good songs. They wish that we would do them in our worship sets. <laughs> but we have chosen not to do them because they have offended weaker brothers and sisters in the faith. Uh, back, I think it was springtime or whatever, there was a couple that was here and we had a, uh, a song they were doing. It was a good song, but it was written by Hillsong and all that. And a couple got up and ran out of here mad, upset. The gal was crying and, and they ran out of here like their hair was on fire. And I talked to them across the street and, oh, and they said, you don't have any discernment. You're allowing that, that song, oh, man, it's horrible kind of thing. And, I, you know, I've talked to them for a while and, gone, you know, tried to let them understand, yeah, I know that there's some problems with that, with, you know, with the theology and all that kind of stuff that's going on the Hillside. But the song is good. Oh, no, you're promoting them, you're this and you're that and, and all that stuff. But the thing is, those songs that, that we've done are good songs. <laughs> You know, man, they're awesome songs, as a matter of fact. But because of who wrote them and what church they came from, some believers can, in good conscience, sing them. It's just like weaker believers back in Paul's time that couldn't eat the meat that was coming out of the, the meat markets. As we saw last week, those meat markets were at the back of the pagan temples. All of the meat sold there had already been sacrificed to an idol. And Paul (laughs) said, the idol's nothing, man. But if your weaker brother or sister is stumbled by it, and Paul even said himself, if my meat, my eating meat is going to stumble somebody, then I'm not going to eat meat for as long as I live then, kind of thing. And it's really the same kind of deal, you know. And we, or at least we that think (laughs) that we're strong in the faith, Paul's saying here, we've got to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to seek to please ourselves. But I like that song. (laughs) And and you know, but I, 
That's the problem. Eye disease. <laughs> but I, and when my wife and I were in Hawaii, we went to Calvary Chapel of Lahui. And during the worship time, it was just really neat. There, you know, man, it was a blessing. We we're there worshiping the Lord. And, ah, oh, man, it was awesome. And they sang two Hillsong songs. And they sing the song, um, Reckless Love. And <laughs> we were both just blessed, just singing it. Oh, we were just, just you know, worshiping the Lord. And it didn't appear anybody in that fellowship had any kind of problem with any of those songs. And you know what? That's okay. They could do. If, if they don't have a problem with that, if the, nobody there has a problem with that, okay, then it's all right. But here, we've got people that have problems <laughs> with the songs. So the leadership and I were aware of those problems, and we made that decision that, you know, we pr should probably not do those songs in order to not offend, to not stumble the weaker brothers and sisters. And we'll just walk in love. We'll bear with the scruples of the weak. And if you feel <laughs> that you really have to hear and sing those songs, here's what you can do. Remember what we saw last week in Romans chapter 14, verse 22. He says, do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. If you sincerely have no problem with certain songs that we don't do here, well, then buy the CDs, okay? Buy them, play them at home, play them in your car or truck, and praise God while you do. And, and if I'm sitting in the car or truck with you, then you know what? I'll praise the Lord with you. <laughs> you know? But for here, we need to be like-minded. We need to look out for the weaker brothers and sisters, you know? When we make decisions here, folks, understand this, and this kind of goes for everything. When we make decisions to do or not do things here, we really do search the scriptures. We prayerfully consider everyone involved in every aspect that we can think of. And sometimes we even seek counsel outside of our, our fellowship uh, before we make a decision. And so, folks, let's be like-minded, all right? Let's look out for the needs of others. Let's, let's just stop putting ourselves first and say, Lord, I want to be like you. I, I want to love people like you love people. I want to set myself aside. There's plenty of songs <laughs> that we sing. There's plenty of awesome songs that we sing. And the fact that if you like some of those songs we don't sing, like just get the CD. If you're listening to Christian radio and they play it, crank it up, man. Have that faith between you and God. Just don't stumble your brothers and sisters and don't get your socks in a knot and cause divisions because we're not doing something you think we ought to do. We thought and prayed a lot about these kind of things. Hope you understand that. In verse 7, he says, Therefore, because of all of that, receive one another, just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Remember, he said, receive the weaker person in the faith, but not just to argue with them. Here he says, receive one another just as Christ also received us. How did Christ receive you? Think about that. Did, did he insist that we grow up first, that we become spiritually mature before he would save us, before he would have fellowship with us? Yeah. Okay, I'll save you, but don't talk to me until you grow up. And, and then in about 15, 20 years, then come back and see me and check in. And if you've grown up enough, then I'll talk to you, maybe. That's not what he did, is it? He received us just as we were, right? He, he received us with all of our nonsense, with all of our goofy thoughts, with all of our bad habits, with all of our sin and yuck. And yeah, he said, repent. He said, turn from the sin. And hopefully everyone here has been turning from their sin ever since, right? And since he received us, he's fellowshiped with us, right? He's had communion with us. He sent his Holy Spirit to live inside of us. And we can go boldly before the throne of grace. We can pray 24-7 anytime we want to go to him. He receives us in all of our imperfections. 
and in receiving us. Folks, he works in us. We've seen that. We saw it last week. And he, he wants to bring us to spiritual maturity. In other words, what he's doing after he receives us is he works on conforming us into the image of Christ. And folks, the less that we seek our own needs and instead seek to bless others, the more we'll be like Jesus. The more we want to see our brothers and sisters be drawn closer to Christ and be matured in Christ. And as we're bearing with them, as we're loving them, as we're considering them, putting their needs first, the more we're going to be like Jesus. The more, and that's actually the real sign of maturity, that we stop putting ourselves first and we become more like Jesus. Now, continuing on in that thought of Jesus as our example, and thinking of others first, Paul shows how Jesus put the needs of both the Jews and the Gentiles on such a high priority, which includes, uh, includes those in Rome, uh, and, and what he did, how he set aside his own needs. He, and in doing so, he quotes several of the Old Testament passage, uh, passages that were written for our benefit, for our learning. Look at verses 8 and 9. Now I say that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcision for the truth of God, to confirm the promises made to the fathers, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy as it is written, for this reason I will confess to you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And that's 2 Samuel 22.50 and Psalms 18.49. Then in verse 10 he says, and again he says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. Deuteronomy 32, 43. In verse 11, and again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Laud him, all you peoples. Psalms 117, 11. Verse 12, and again, Isaiah says, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. In him the Gentiles shall hope. And that's 11, Isaiah 11, 1. And verse 10. See, showing that the fact that God loves the Gentiles and would reach out to, to them with salvation is no new concept. That he kept his promise to the Jews and he is using those promises as well as what he's doing and using the apostles to reach out to the Gentiles to save them as well. In verse 13, he says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And folks, that's how that's going to happen, by the power of the Holy Spirit. The more we surrender to Him, the more joy, peace, and power for living we're going to have. We have to surrender to Him and allow Him to remove the junk that is self and fill us with Himself. We get out of the way, He fills that void with Himself. And then, hey, we're going to have that joy and the peace and the power for living. In verse 14, Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. See, Paul has been admonishing them and us through this whole uh, letter to the Roman Christians. He's letting them know here that he knows they're not bad folks, and they're full of all goodness. They're not a bunch of spiritual babies, you know, that uh, they're filled with all knowledge, and that they have the ability to admonish each other, just as he has been admonishing them. It's an interesting thing, and I think I have the time to share this, that able to admonish, in some translations, is uh, worded competent to counsel. And in uh, Jay Adams' book that he wrote back in the 70s, early 70s, uh, he makes that point that any believer who is well-versed in Scripture, who knows the Word of God and knows and understands its application, is competent to give counsel. In fact, that's the only person who really should be giving counsel is somebody who knows God, knows His Word, and rightly divides it because if you're going to secular psychologists and psychiatrists that don't know God, they're going to give you the world's advice on how to live. And it ain't going to be good. It's not going to be godly. And so he says, you guys are competent to counsel. You're able to admonish each other. 
in verses 15 and 16, he says, Nevertheless, brethren, I have written more boldly to you on some points as reminding you because of the grace given to me by God that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Think of what he just said right there that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable. Might be. So if it might be, then we need to understand then, it's possible for what we offer to God to not be acceptable, right? If something might be, then it's a possibility that it might not be, right? When we try and, quote, worship God, contrary to how he has said he is to be worshiped or when we try to worship him and our hearts aren't right trying to worship while being self-seeking as he has been talking about here before with a me first kind of attitude not walking in love towards one another that kind of worship is not acceptable to god in matthew 15 7 through 9 Jesus talked about the religious leaders here. He says, hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Jesus said that those religious hypocrites were worshiping in vain. Worshiping the right God. You know, Isaiah's quote is really God speaking through Isaiah saying, in vain they worship me. Me. And it's in capital letters in every translation that I've read because it's God speaking through Isaiah. They're worshiping the right God, but it was all in vain, which means to be useless, to be of no avail, because their hearts were far from God. See, folks, if we're self-seeking, if we're unloving, if we're not surrendered to God's will, We can sing, and you know what? It doesn't matter what song you sing or don't sing. If your hearts are wrong, it'll be in vain. It'll be useless. You know, a lot of worship leaders like to to quote the verse that talks about worshiping God in spirit and in truth. And it's unfortunate, though, that oftentimes it's not happening even for that particular worship leader sometimes, when they're self-willed, when they're disobeying God, when they're doing their own thing and they're not loving, they're not honoring God. They're not really worshiping God in truth or real spiritual worship. Paul wrote to them, he said, more boldly about some of these hard issues, about some of these tough issues, he says, to remind them He needed to remind them because these issues are important. Remember, we talked about a couple of weeks ago how some issues were real important back then, not so much now, but some that weren't too too big of a deal. They didn't have too much of a problem with. uh, We have a lot more problem than they did now. Well, these things that he's writing to them about, about not seeking our own will, about putting others first, folks, that's a huge issue then and now. That's one of those things because our flesh is the flesh. It's, it's, it's at war with God that we have to be reminded about this stuff. We have to be reminded that we need to surrender to the Lord and, and, and give up our rights oftentimes. <laughs> and if he ignored those things and, and just said the things that they wanted to hear, he's really inferred that he would not have been a real minister of Jesus Christ. He wouldn't have been a, a real servant of Christ. He'd be what is referred to in the Bible as a man pleaser, <laughs> not a minister. And, and that word minister means servant. He wouldn't be a servant of Jesus Christ. He'd be a man pleaser. <laughs> and and it's, been, it's been said before, and it's true, that sometimes the job of any, of any real servant of Christ, especially that of a pastor, is to comfort the disturbed and to disturb the comfortable. (laughs) And folks, you know, Jesus said, Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. 
verses 17 through 21, he says, Therefore I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus in the things which pertain to God. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed to make the Gentiles obedient. That's another phrase for coming to salvation, surrendering your lives to Christ. Uh, to make the Gentiles obedient in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about uh, Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. And so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation, but as it is written, to whom he was not announced, they shall see, and those who have not heard shall understand." Paul's desire wasn't to play it safe and be comfortable to only go where others had preached at established churches so he could just go and give them a pet talk and move along to the next church. Paul wanted God to use him in reaching people that had never heard of Jesus before. He wanted to boldly go where no one had gone before with the gospel. <laughs> and verses 22 through 24, he said, For this reason, I also have been much hindered from coming to you. But now, no longer having a place in these parts and having a great desire these many years to come to you, whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you. For I hope to see you on my journey and to be helped on my way there by you, if first I may enjoy your company for a while. Understand what he's saying. It's kind of tough to put all together, but basically, because Paul wanted to preach the gospel and establish churches where no one had heard of Jesus before, he'd been hindered from coming to Rome to, to encourage those believers at Rome because they were already there, and there were so many different places that Paul was going and, and preaching the gospel to that he never really got around to going to Rome. It was not high on the priority list like it was to go to places that had never heard about Jesus and to establish churches there. <laughs> and it, it seemed for Paul that there was always some new place to go where they hadn't heard of Jesus. So he never got to them at Rome. But now, he says, but now no longer having a place in these parts. You know what he's saying? He's saying, you know, at this point in my ministry, <laughs> there's no longer anywhere in this part of the world that hasn't heard of Jesus. It's time to move on. <laughs> it's time to go to Spain and, and on into Europe uh, after Spain. And, and we don't know for sure if Paul ever made it to Spain and then into Europe. Church tradition says that he did. In verses 25 through 26, it says, But now I am going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints, for it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. In Acts 19.11, we read about that. It says, When these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in the Spirit, when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, to go to Jerusalem, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. Paul did see Rome. That we know for sure. We know that from the book of Acts. He went to Jerusalem carrying this monetary gift from the Gentile churches from Macedonia and Achaia. He, he went there and he brought it to the poor saints in Jerusalem. They were poor because of their faith in Jesus. They were being persecuted. And so they lost jobs, they lost businesses, all because of their faith. And Paul brought that gift and gave it to the elders at Jerusalem. He preached the gospel there and was arrested. <laughs> and then ultimately taken to Rome to stand before Caesar. And he knew he'd get there. He knew he was going to Rome. God had spoken to his heart and told him, you're going there. But he just didn't know Rome was going to pay for the trip. Yeah. <laughs> but he went there uh, as a prisoner. And Acts closes, the book of Acts closes with Paul being kept under house arrest for two years, waiting to stand before Caesar. Uh, and while there, Paul wrote the, the uh, book of Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. And history tells us that Paul did stand before Caesar Nero, and he witnessed to him. He shared the gospel to him. And, and Caesar, though, rejected the gospel. He released Paul. And shortly afterwards, Caesar went nuts. He went mad. And a lot of people surmise it was because he rejected the gospel. But 
he went nuts and that's the whole burning of Rome and all that other kind of stuff that happened, you know, playing the fiddle while Rome burned or that whole tradition or whatever. But that's, that's what happened there. And tradition says that Paul did go to Spain, which was then a Roman colony. Uh, and then he went on into Europe preaching the gospel. Uh, he was later rearrested, tried before Caesar again, and then executed at Rome. But at this point, He's on his way to bring aid to the poor believers, uh, or as he calls them, saints, in Jerusalem uh, that was given by the Gentile churches. And understand, uh, the word saint doesn't mean that uh, you're some kind of special class of Christian if you're a saint. My first pastor used to say there's, there's two types of people in the whole world, saints and ain'ts. You know, a saint is simply, it means set apart. A saint is any believer in Jesus Christ because we have been set apart from the world that is perishing. You have been sanctified, which is another definition of saint or another synonym there. We've been sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ because of our faith in him. So we've been set apart. And so, so in verse 27, it says, It pleased them indeed, and they are their debtors, that is the Gentiles are the debtors to the Jews, for if the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to them in material things. Remember, he had mentioned it earlier in this epistle, I think it was like chapter 11, that from the Jews came the word of God. From the Jews came the promises of God. Even Jesus himself was a Jew. Remember, he talked all about that. And we Gentiles, we non-Jews, are partakers of all of these, as he calls here, spiritual things that came by way of the Jews. And, and the least Paul felt that they could do was to help their Jewish brothers and sisters with material things. In fact, he says, it's your duty. Verses 28 and 29, therefore... When I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, I shall go by way of you to Spain. But I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. And he did go there. Acts tells us that he was actually able to receive any and all visitors while he was under house arrest. Now, can you imagine you're a believer at Rome and you hear Paul's coming? Well, he's in chains, but he's coming. And then you find out, okay, they put him on house arrest. He's waiting to stand before Caesar because, remember, he's a Roman citizen, and the Jews tried to put him to death, and there was illegal and all that. And so, hey, man, let's go talk to Paul. Can you imagine sitting down and talking to Paul and having him expound on the gospel? having him give you some insights on some of the Old Testament passages and some of the things he wrote. Hey, Paul, you know, when you wrote to the Corinthians, that second letter, what did you mean by this? And, and can you imagine being able to do that? And they got to do that. And in verses 30 uh, through 33, he says, Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, that I may come to you with joy by the will of God and may be refreshed together with you. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Paul begged them to pray for him. <laughs> and remember, he, he knew there was going to be trouble as it says here, from those in Ju Judea who do not believe. Remember, he told the Ephesian elders that when he met them there in Miletus in Acts chapter 20, verses 22 and 23, he said, And see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to be there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. Remember Agabus? You know, doing the, the Agabus rag. <laughs> when he binds himself with his own belt. And, hey, yo, the Lord says that the guy who owns this, you know, the, he actually bound himself with Paul's rope, uh, belt. <laughs> so the guy that owns his belt, man, it is going to be bound and all that. And so Paul was warned over and over again. But even though he knew there would be trouble, <laughs> it didn't stop him. It didn't even slow him down from going because he believed that was God's will for him to go there. And so he knew that he would be needing a lot of prayer. 
And so he begs them, I'm begging you. Just like I'm begging you, pray for us when we're in Kenya. You know, pray. He says, I'm begging you here. And he, he knew that a lot of prayer would be needed because of the great opposition that would be there. And not just by the unbelieving Jews, but Paul knew what was behind all that. Satan. Satan hates the gospel. He doesn't like to see the gospel go forth. He doesn't like to see people saved. He wants to see people go to hell. And God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So he sends guys like Paul to places where there are believers. And Paul, he was a tough guy. He went knowing that there was problems. And Paul says here he wants to come to them at Rome with joy. And you know what he did? Even though he was in chains, he was still full of joy. Again, one of the letters that he wrote while he was there in prison was Philippians. And the whole theme of Philippians is joy. And, and here it seems he's finished with writing. He, you know, that's it. Amen. Well, like all good preachers, you know, when you hear in closing, that might mean there's another half hour or so, you know. <laughs> and so there's a whole other chapter that hopefully, prayerfully, we will finish uh, next week. Uh, and that's Lord willing. Uh, even though, and, and, and if you read ahead, if you read, there is a lot of personal greetings there. Greet so-and-so, greet this person, greet that person. But there's still a lot of stuff there in Romans 16 uh, for us today. And we'll see that next week, Lord willing. Let's stand up and pray. Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for what you have kept there for our learning for our admonition, Lord, for <laughs> our reminding. Lord, help us. Help us to be like you. Help us to take the example that you set, Jesus, by denying yourself and, and, and doing what you did for everyone else. Help us to take that example. Help us to crucify the flesh, Lord, that we could live to you live to please you in one of those ways by, by looking out for the needs of others. Help us, Lord, to be other-centered and not self-centered. We want to be like you, Lord. Help us. Without you, we can do nothing. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.